All right. Um, thank you, uh, Dario, for, for joining me in this conversation. Um, I know you are a person with a lot of human resources experience, and I really appreciate your time uh, joining in, in this call. Um, if you want to get started first, I would like you to, to please state your name and, and background in the human resources field. Okay. Uh, I'm Dario Gamboa. Uh, I was born in Colombia. I have six brothers, went to a French school, uh, did a year of engineering, then was a Jesuit for nine years. Then I studied philosophy and literature so as a Jesuit. I did a master's in education and counseling and human resources at uh, the University of Texas in Denton. And then I did a PhD in intercultural communications in Minnesota. Uh, intercultural, yeah. And then I, I live in Miami now, happily married, two sons, one in New York, the other in Paris. That's my background, uh, summarizing 60 years in college after high school and 40 years of professional experience as a HR. I'm currently a consultant, semi-retired, board of directors and just doing my dreams. Nice, that's, that's great to hear. Um, what roles have you had in, inside specifically in the human, re, human resources field? That's true. Well, I, I wanted to tell you first that I, I started uh, human resources because I was an educator uh, at the mm. very beginning. I mean, as a Jesuit and as a, as a master's in education, I always love education and, and, and of course training. And one you were of the professor in college, I, right? You were professor in college. Oh, yes. Yes, I was professor in Minnesota. I was professor in the Jesuits in Colombia. I was professor most of my life. And so I, th I thought training was a key part of everybody's life. I mean, I still think that training is from birth to death. Uh, you, you continuously renew yourself. And so all the jobs that I get, got were basically because I was good at training or at, at educating or at, uh, and then of course it, that's related with HR with human resources management so uh, just summarizing rapidly my 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 background is uh, uh, as soon as I graduated from masters I was hired to do a job with the Colombian government East Tex, uh, doing managing the international scholarship from the Colombian government. I did that for one year, but then I was really into international education. Then I got a job at the University of Minnesota as a foreign student advisor. And uh, at the same time, I could do my PhD uh, for free because uh, that, that was I was a staff member. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I learned a lot from many, many, many students from uh, different backgrounds. And I was kind of the advisor for all the nationality clubs. So I, I could see the needs in different cultures for, for education. Most of them, they were masters or PhD students. Then I was hired to work in Citibank Brazil. Uh, mm -hmm. I had a girlfriend at that time that was Brazilian. So it, it, everything matched. And uh, they hired me as the head of manpower planning and development but mostly development uh, for, for the Citibank Brazil organization. Okay. Uh, I moved to Rio de Janeiro, and then I, I was in charge of the Citibank training center for, for Latin America, for Citibank. And, uh, and of course I was in charge of uh, manpower planning and development, but the most important thing was the training of, of employees. And we, I mean, Citibank is a fantastic uh, company. They invested a lot in Brazil. At that time, they were very big, 5,000 employees. And uh, we had a training center for all the banking industry, which is interesting how a company like Citibank was training uh, their competitors. And the idea was you train people so the level of banking in Brazil is high. So anyone uh, working for, for Brazilian banks would have a, 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 a first-class banking philosophy and, uh, of doing business. So I did uh, in Brazil. Then I, after 10 years, uh, I did a little bit of consulting. I moved to Miami. And in Miami, I was hired by Visa to be the manager for training for the banks. <laughs> and, and Visa, and, and that was interesting. That was my first job, uh, training manager for the banks of Visa. Visa 
is was associated with banks. Always, it, it worked Still through is. banks. Yeah, and uh, and they they thought that I could do a Latin American training center here in Miami, and that's that was the interesting thing because I started as the head of training for Latin America for Visa, mm -hmm. uh, implementing a, a training center. And then the, the, my boss uh, decided that I could do human resources. Uh, and so it was the two positions, but basically I never left the, the training, training area. So and your first quick question, and I'm yeah. sorry to interrupt you. Yeah, um, yeah. So your first uh, HR role, specifically HR outside of training was in Miami with Visa as a more of a human resources yes. uh, aspect of things, right? Because before you were just doing a lot of training with Citibank, um, but, but, but but Go Citibank ahead. was but Citibank was also HR was within the HR, yeah, yeah. but it was the planning of the employees, uh, the how to acquire them and then how to develop them, and that's the where the training came in. But the employees was specifically for a Citibank was internal. Was it internal internal employees Both. of Citibank as Both. well as external yes. uh, other banks who were also so you did like kind of a, a group thing for more of just like exactly. a. Oh, it a was more huge. holistic experience, yeah. A more it holistic was huge. training. It was huge. We we did we did training. The training center never stopped there. We had classes every day, and that's presential classes for yeah. for banks in in Brazil and for uh, employees. The employees would get into into the training uh, programs, and mm -hmm. most executives from Citibank were the teachers. I mean, it, they, 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 okay. they were, I mean, the guy in, 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 in uh, you know, in, in risk management was the one teaching risk management, the, the guy in corporate banking, the guy in, in, uh, in all the different areas of the bank, treasury, finance, how to, teach, how to do that. We were teaching that to our internal employees and to the banks. So you were selling it like as well to other people exactly. and people were buying it as, as the, the face of Citibank and kind you, of... Uh... You, you got it. You got it. Mm -hmm. and, and, and then they love it because it became a profit center. The training mm -hmm. center became a profit center. I could manage my own budget because I had all the revenues from all the customers. Yeah. So training became a self-sufficient area of human resources. And, wow. and the, people, the people in the bank, they love it because I, yeah. I was not any cost for the company. Absolutely. And you guys would have banks, local banks from Brazil, Bradesco, all the, all the all, big ones. All of them. All yeah, of they, them. Because, because obviously they see Citibank as such a big international exactly. brand. And exactly. And kind of get the reputation behind it. No, absolutely. That exactly. Makes a, lot of sense. Um, a quick question. Yeah. yeah. Go no, ahead. No, I, that's the other thing that happened with Visa. Because Visa, we did also for training yeah. for the bank members in Visa-related issues. But we mm -hmm. could train our own people as well. And, and of our employees were the, the, the training person, the training people for all the bank in Latin America. You were going to ask of a course. question, I'm sorry. No, I was going to ask um, in regards to the Latin America training center that you guys had in Miami, that was more specific towards also your clients, right? Because uh, in, in, in experience that I've had, at least in the, in the field, there's there's a specific area that obviously the, the, the visa business, uh, the payments business is very complicated. Right. Yes. So for many banks and many smaller banks in the Caribbean and throughout Latin America, obviously, it's a very difficult uh, process to, 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 to gain knowledge, right? So yes. um, was your training more focused on training these individuals in terms of, of your clients so they can understand the business, so they can make better decisions, so they can manage risk better? Or was it more based on, on focusing on your own employees in terms of like career development um, was it more based on, it, it was, yeah, how it was, was it? The visa one was much more oriented to our customers, mm -hmm. to all the, all the banks in Latin America. There were many, many, many banks from all the different countries. Uh, they would come to do, uh, you know, anything related to the visa business, you know, how to acquire in and uh, how to do yeah. chargebacks, how to do uh, all the different operations in technology in, in business development. In, 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 in new products uh, and how, how to operate new products. How to, I mean, I was in Visa when Visa created the debit card. And, and mm -hmm. this, this is incredible. The uh, debit card was never uh, before. It was credit cards, but debit card became, uh, and then we needed to train everybody. 
in, in the debit card business. But the, the few people that, all the teachers were employees. The yes. senior employees from Visa were the ones. And, and again, it was fantastic because I would invite all these executives from Latin America to come to Miami for a week long program or for a three days program. And of course they were ah, here in Miami is inviting us to come. So that was <laughs> making money as well. And so all the HR yeah. and training operation was self-financed uh, through my training centers. That's, oh, that's Visa. Okay. Okay. Then yeah, please uh, continue on the path. Then the, the Western Union. Uh, Western Union was much more internal training. I tried to get into the, the training for all the agents, but Western Union was very, the, the, the agents for Western Union were very small agents in many places of, the, of Latin America. They were major uh, uh, distributors of, of Western Union, but they, they were independent. We managed much more the leadership through some programs, not as much as, as, as with Visa, but Western Union, uh, we had to, to, to train a lot of, of people uh, internally, you know, mm -hmm. our, own, our own employees. Mm -hmm. uh, so that, 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 that's the reason why, why I, I had this, uh, this function in Western Union for many years. But the most interesting thing in Western Union was the, the relationship to leadership. In Western Union, I was the senior vice president for HR. And then I had a lot of influence in how we were training senior executives. Western Union needed to have that. Uh, and then globally, I was part of a three people team that would plan the, 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 the training for leadership. And as such, that the biggest uh, uh, function that I had in Western Union was the leadership training for executives. And that, that was a very different approach, very interesting because it was through a program that we research in the market uh, as the program to implement worldwide. So we got a group of people, we trained, I became a master facilitator in that program. And that was the leadership challenge program. And that's a program that is in the market, is open for everybody. For me, that was the most interesting thing in Western Union. Then I moved to Illumno. Uh, Illumno is uh, an organization that manages uh, universities that are becoming virtual universities. So we, we, we acquire universities and we develop universities to become virtual education, to have virtual education. We spent the last eight years there. And uh, that was at the global level. And uh, uh, then the training became much more uh, into how to change, to adjust to virtual education, to uh, professors and educators that were used to presential education and that they were feeling that they were losing uh, something in their life if they would mm -hmm. accept virtual classes or becoming virtual teachers. So that, that, that's essentially what I did in LUMNO. And, and that was the main role that I had in my career, uh, summarizing. No, thank you so much. Um, I, I wanted to ask you a couple of quick questions in terms of um, your differences and your background in terms of the way that you taught, um, let's say the employees, right? The employees in Visa, the, the teams that you had over there, um, the employees that you had in, in Citibank, obviously you guys were training, um, I wouldn't say lower level, but I would say uh, regular entry level jobs or, or kind of people who were just getting the grips of the, the business. Um, what would you say is the main differentiating factor between training these type of individuals who are just learning about the, the business and chain, and training senior leadership who know much more about the business, who've been in there for a while, who are now learning to, to manage people and how to, how to get the best out of people, right? What would you say is the main difference between those two experiences? This is, this is a very good question. Very, very good question because there is a, there is a clear difference. Uh, let me say something that maybe you guys that are in, in higher education would hate to, to hear, but when you graduate from a university, usually from the employer's point of view, you know nothing about the business. You have to be first class student 
uh, you learn the day you get in. And I imagine you had a personal experience of, of having a fancy bachelor's degree, whatever, and get into a company and realizing that, oh my God, I need to learn everything you know, on this. So junior employees feel the need to learn and to learn fast and, and to adjust to the company culture. Uh, usually in the universities, unfortunately, there are too many theories that are seldom put into practice and sometimes a little bit disconnected with the company realities. And the first shock uh, for fancy graduates is that they have to learn again and when entering a new company. Now, the difference with senior employees is the senior employees, they have been there for 10, 15 years, usually now is much less, but yeah. they say, ah, I know everything. I don't need to learn anything. So. Uh, this is this is just for young people. Uh, I have experience. Uh, I know everything. Uh, the, the people that need to adjust is the newcomers, the, the younger employees. So there is a disconnect a little bit on that. And uh, in, in addition, I am very busy. I don't have the time to do to the training. But many times, the, the, the senior employees, you I, I would differentiate senior employees, the people that are senior employees because they have been forever doing that type of job. They have been many years mm -hmm. and they think, oh, the, the experience, this is, it has been always been done this way. Why to question at this time? Mm -hmm. uh, now, there are others that uh, have had a little bit more education, like a master's degree or something like that. And they come to the companies realizing that they need to change things that they, they need to question things. So when they start questioning things, that's what the senior employees or senior level employees, that's where they add value. They transform the organization. And when the organization is open for those people, then is, that's why they are so valuable. And so they are senior employees with a lot of experience. They trust their experience. They are senior employees with not too much experience, but fresh ideas, much many more uh, adjusted to the new realities. Mm -hmm. So there is a need to have both of them. Uh, it, it, it's a combination of experiences. So the difference to me, once they are hungry, the others are uh, after lunch. <laughs> so they, <laughs> they, 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 they don't need, but uh, sooner or later they will realize if they don't renew their ideas, uh, they would become obsolete. No, That's yeah, true. That does, that does make sense a lot. Um, I had a couple of questions in regard to, to what you just said in, in terms of, um, did you ever find, um, what would you find more difficult to manage? Would it be the person who, in terms of training, right? In terms of kind of growing, would it be the person who knows very little, the person who's kind of getting, getting absorbing all the information at first, or would it be the, the executive who's been there for a while, as you mentioned, and who's, who's has the experience. Um, and in regards to change management, right? Because I mean, there is a, a lot of things that um, that happen on a, on a daily basis that revolve around change, right? So you mentioned that you were also working with alumno and these professors who were um, afraid of the future, afraid of virtual learning, afraid of all these things that were coming at them because they were so used to doing the same things over and over again. Did you ever see any um, similarities between the way that some senior executives would view training and some professors would view this new change uh, that was coming inside of this virtual learning environment? I, I would say it, 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 this is not because of age or because of, of people. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I would say more is because of the type of people. There are people that do not question the background, are not open to see new things. And they could be very old and they could be very young as well. Uh, and so th there are young people that they say, no, 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 no. Th this is what gives me security. I'm not going to change just for change. There are other people that say, why not change? So this is a very personal attitude. In my opinion, it, be it comes from uh, education, from family education, from a personal experiences. Uh, so I wouldn't say this is become of, uh, but to give yeah. a generalization, uh, I would say, yeah, uh, uh, older people, uh, 
long-time employees tend to be much more conservative. And that's where young people with uh, a lot of diplomacy and a lot of uh, tact, they could start changing things. Now, how do you do as an HR person combine this, these two factors? Uh, to me, there is an important thing is, I believe, I don't believe in theoretical education, theory and then practice. I believe in experience, reflection, and learning after experience. Uh, uh, I, I don't know if you, you recall, I mean, every army in the world, they do every single day in any operation, the learning after doing. They finish the day and they say, what happened? What went right? What went wrong? How can we improve tomorrow? Continuous feedback, continuous feedback. And to, if you ask me, what is the key for training? To me is experience and learning from experience. What did go well? What did go, what could be better? Uh, so analyze experience. We all learn from experience. This is the, 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 the learnings that last. The, the ones that are theory, you have forgot all of them. I forgot all the algebra, all the mathematics, all the things. You don't know anything. You, you, you learn from practice. So that's the big difference, in my opinion. That makes sense. Um, and in, in, in line with these teachings, right, in line with these, uh, the ideas of learning and experience, um, as an HR professional, um, you can't really, it's very difficult to do some sort of teaching and experience when you have a session full of 15, 16, 20 executives, right, in a room, uh, but you guys are supposed to have a training session, right? So was there any specific methods that you would use with your senior executives in terms of, of leadership training, right? I mean, the way that it's, 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 it's trial and error, it's learning and reflecting, right? Um, are there any specific methods that you used as an HR professional um, with these executives or with the uh, lower level ones? Um, it could be a specific uh, type of a uh, method of like reflection. It could be a monthly visit or a kind of a, how, how would you interact with these executives um, okay. in terms of like, would it be specific training sessions? How, how, how would the interaction be in terms of um, getting these, uh, getting these individuals, getting these professionals to reflect on their actions and learn from, from their experiences? That's very interesting. I mean, there are many different ways of doing things. I would summarize, and I think the, the most important thing is uh, the feedback. Feedback, but feedback can be done one-on-one, -on -one, but feedback, 360 feedback in a company, 360 degrees mean that you receive feedback from your boss, from your peers, from your subordinates. And it's, 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 every, it's, it's a circle. It's a holistic, it's a holistic. It's a holistic feedback. And so uh, one of the most beautiful experiences as an HR was to convince the, the senior management, the president of the company, that this is the key for success. 360 feedback. And 360 feedback as the way to evaluate the success of any executive by getting feedback from uh, 20 people, for example, the, 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 the supervisor, the colleagues, the subordinate, the customers, internal customers, external customers. Mm -hmm. So uh, I implemented, for example, the last two companies, and I learned that in, in Western Union. That's the leadership challenge program. People get a survey for you, please give feedback on this and this and this. And here are the 20 questions. And the questions are the key for the key leadership skills that are needed to, and so everybody gets uh, a, a feedback on behavior, specific behaviors. It's not if you are good or you are bad, it's how good you are at for example, uh, being an example to your subordinates or to your colleagues. This person reflects the values of the company. This person reflects, uh, I mean, you could be see as a role model. Could you see him as an inspiring person? And there are 
facts that say yes, from one to 10, is one or is, or is a 10. Uh, could you see him as an innovator, as a person that brings new ideas and implement new ideas? Could you see him or her as a, a person that enables others to work, that delegates well or not? Could you see him or her as a person that uh, congratulates, uh, in, uh, encourages- Positive feedback, or, yeah, positive yeah, encouragement. Positive, positive feedback, reinforcement. and then when, then the sessions, all the sessions for the leadership program, the first thing that you receive is the summary of the feedback of the 360 is personal. And then we talk about all the different skills and people compare their feedbacks and they learn from each other. Oh my God, I, 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 I saw presidents of companies receiving feedback from their subordinates and from their colleagues and boy, discovering that they were garbage to them, that, 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 they, they, that they didn't realize how bad they were. And we had to get people out of the company uh, because of that, or we could discover leaders that were totally hidden that nobody realized, but everybody agreed that it was good. So to me, the, that type of training, 360 degree, where you get feedback from others, again, is feedback at the highest level, but given to, to, the, to a person in a respectful way with a coach doing uh, you know, it one-to-one. -one. That was my role in, in, in the last uh, eight years. Uh, I would say the last 15 years, because in Western Union and in Lumno, that was my key role. You know, giving those courses, providing this feedback to all these people, and getting to the bosses the result of the feedback, which were the basic part of the performance review and the compensation of the people. So when you get into that, that leadership training, that leadership feedback was the key for performance review, for compensation, and for advancement in the company. Then you have a comprehensive way of, of getting people into a single culture. In the, the culture that the, creating a company culture exactly kind exactly of, uh, exactly a good place to work and kind of make sure that everybody's on board and kind of yes and reiterate that through the values and kind of uh, experiences yeah. um that that's great I think I think I wanted to ask you another question in regards yeah. to um the training right more specifically of training of employees because I feel like we were we were diverting into more of a factor on uh, feedback and growth right because that is that is essential for the quote unquote training of an employee, right? Mm -hmm. um, but what would you consider um, in terms of a, of a lifespan of an employee, right? From the beginning, um, the, the training that, uh, the onboarding, right? The onboarding of an individual into a company culture from the entry level job um, up to the, the growth, the, the management of other people, right? Which is another important aspect into, into a, an employee's life. You become a manager, you become a director, you grow into a vice president and all these roles that kind of experience um, that require different types of training, right? What would you consider as, as, as your experience has been from the bottom to, to, to the senior leadership, what would you consider the most important uh, aspect of training for an employee in any organization? Uh, that's a good question, it's difficult to answer because I, I believe there are two types of training. There's one that is the tactical training you know, the, the, how to, how to uh, implement a, a, a risk management. A software, yeah. yeah software. Kind of like, yeah. These are things, I mean, you do A plus B equals C, that's a tactical one that you could learn by yourself uh, mm -hmm. online, you know, or you could go to a course where everybody's working on that. Uh, that's, that's one type. The other type is the training for, for the company and uh, for the products of the company, for the, mm -hmm. the philosophy of the company. Uh, my feeling is that the younger you get employees, the easier to train them into the culture. And uh, as, as such, I, I implemented in Citibank and in Visa, what we call the management trainee program, which is people recently graduated, we selected from very different universities in Citibank, we went all over Brazil, getting these people and analyzing them and offering them to become part of the company, not in a specific department, 
but to have two years program in which you spend six months in finance, six months in the, uh, corporate banking, six months in uh, uh, whatever other area technology. And then in two years, we could see what were his, his or her preferences. You have to match training to the passions of the employees. This is a, a very important thing. If the employee is not uh, emotionally attached to any area of the bank or the organization that you are, that you don't have a person that is committed to learning. You need to be emotionally attached to whatever you are learning. And that's when that happens, then you, you, you can change different approaches. You can have uh, on the job training, uh, spending six months in an area where you want to improve the skills of this person, or you could have formal training. Uh, I believe much more in on the job training, again, with multiple feedback, multiple mm -hmm. feedback on the job training with a weekly meeting with your boss, weekly meeting with your uh, customer, uh, yeah. so the person learned. And the best learning is the one that the employee himself or herself does, because that, that's where you learn, when you realize, uh -huh, this was good, this, was, this could be different. Uh, that's again. Now, at the highest level, it, again, I, I come back to the 360. The 360 to me, that, that was absolutely, when you get feedback, anonymous feedback, you never know who gave feedback for you. Anonymous feedback, and you, and you get all this uh, present. To me, that was a present from your colleagues, your subordinates, your boss. Mm -hmm. And then you learn about yourself. It's the most incredible learning. And, and everybody started and, and, and became really, really passionate about that, about getting the feedback and learning. Well, if I answer your question about uh, uh, the different phases. No, 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 you did, you did. Uh, I think that was very important. Um, I also wanted to, to touch on um, your experiences as an HR professional. Um, would you ever have any pushback from senior leadership in regards to your, to your methods, in regards to training, in regards to the time that it would take? I know in my experience sometimes um, with my organization, uh, when I worked in, 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 in time in, in Miami, um, my senior leadership would seem annoyed and and kind of uh, kind of oh we have to go sit in a room and they have to tell us about um, I don't know change leadership change management all these things that he thought was very uh, didn't soft. didn't matter wasn't very yeah it was very soft the soft skills it's wasting our time where we're sitting here in a room for six hours uh, with some guy who we brought who the company is paying thousands of dollars to for him to tell us about uh, X Y and Z when we have work to do and we're not getting to our work. Right. Would you ever how was how was your communication with um, leadership in regards to kind of the, the, the pushback and the brush off of HR and the importance of training? And how would you react to these type of uh, to this leadership? Again, very good question. Very realistic question. That's not it's absolutely true. I'm from experience. It, it, it happened many times uh, that that's where I mean, the training, in my perception, has to be a decision that is made together between the manager and the employee, never in HR. HR is a, is a conduit, is, a, is an implementer of a management and, and employee decision. Uh, the, that's, to me, the key. HR never manages people, uh, in my perception, my experience. HR is the best partner, the closest partner of, of the closest partner of management. The supervisor is the HR person. I would never accept HR responsibility that everybody has to go to a training center, everybody has to do this. It has to be a decision from management. If everybody has to get this training, it's because the president of the company decided, which is the business partner. Uh, now, if, if there is a program that is needed for any employee, it has to be a decision between the supervisor and the employee. I don't believe either on the supervisor saying, you have to get this training. 
if the employee does not believe or does not uh, accept that, it's going to be useless. Uh, so to me, the decision to go to any specific program, two, two, two days, three days, a week, whatever, is a decision from supervisor and employee, which HR supports. And HR would, and, and you need to be absolutely creative. There is not a single formula for any employee. Uh, if you are wrong on this, you need to go this. No, no, no. Perhaps there are people that would benefit more from an experience in another team for, for, for a month, learning uh, how to do it rather than going to a classroom or, or, or to, a, to a specific session. So you, my answer is, it, it cannot be a decision from HR. It has to be a decision from the supervisor and the employee together, a common agreement. Makes sense. That makes sense. Um, in these same lines, right? I, I know as an HR professional in a company um, in the United States, right? Mm -hmm. So there were there were there were um, laws, right, that were that were given by the government and kind of uh, implemented in terms of most uh, um, organizations in terms of diversity, inclusion. Um, these types of trainings were I don't know if they were during the same time that you were working, but they were pretty much mandatory trainings that were kind of implemented from corporate headquarters and kind of brought down to 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 um, to organizations right throughout the country. Um, how was your uh, interaction or at least your opinion in regards to these, uh, I guess, mandatory diversity, inclusion um, kind of things, talking about women's rights and talking about other uh, key factors that were kind of uh, potent during the time, right? During the time that we were there. I mean, I remember during my experiences at my workplace, there was a um, there was trainings on gun violence, right? So in case there was a, a shooter inside the building, things that were kind of mandatory in terms of safety and kind of inclusion and diversity. Um, how, what was your opinion on these types of trainings uh, during your time? I think most of these trainings are ways of corporations to respond to liabilities that they could come because of uh, lack of learning from the employees. Um, the most common one that I have implemented in my career is the sexual harassment policies. This, those policies in America. Uh, in America, if you don't train your people and you, 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 you prove that everybody went through you this sign training, a sheet, you sign uh, a sheet. Yeah. Uh, yes, uh, you could be liable if any employee says, "Okay, I didn't know the rules." You know, no, 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 no. You have to say, "Yes, I did everything." Now, this has come as a as a mandatory for X, Y, or Z reason. What I turn out to be, rather than having all these people together in the room doing these type of things, we we created this. I created personally uh, uh, some virtual programs uh, that people would take on one-to-one -one base with uh, uh, three or four questions each, each chapter, yes or no. And if you, if you don't pass a certain level of uh, correct answers, you don't get your, your certification. Uh, if you pass, that means you know. And these are questions uh, uh, A, B, or C, this is the correct answer. So you need to take it one, two, three, four times until you pass that. Every, that's in, the, in everybody's responsibility, and there is a central database that, that tells you who did and who didn't do the, the, the program. That way, you, you, you are free, and everybody can do it at their own time, but everybody knows that if, and there is an automatic reminder, you know, if you are not doing this business, maybe your paycheck is not coming. Bingo. <laughs> so so that's, that, that, that's the way to do it, and uh, it happened. But I think it's... it's uh, this is the training that needs to be certified and that's it. The, the rest, and of course, through this type of training, more and more the, the virtual training, the one-to-one -one, uh, with the relationship with the computer in which you, 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 you answer the right and the wrong questions, that's it, you know the subject. There are other types of training where this could be much more impactful you know, where, where you bring real cases uh, uh, about people that have suffered this type of discrimination because uh, they are white or blue or yellow, or whatever, they, that's something 
that when people talk about that in, in small groups, when they realize that there is a human being behind this type of situation, that's where it really, really changed people's behavior. So one is the regulators, the other is the true experience type of, of programs. And those ones, it depends a lot on how you do them. I have to, to tell you that the programs that are not participative in small groups, people learn in groups, people learn when they talk to each other. People learn when the colleague tell you something rather than your boss. Uh, it, 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 it's much more if, uh, effective. Engaging. It's, Engaging, yeah, it's an, yes. Because mm -hmm. you're and paying attention, you're being involved, you're, you're having a conversation with people. Yeah. And there's commitment. And there are many professionals that are masters in doing this type of events, this type of creative meetings that not, do not need to be in a classroom. There are a lot of uh, outdoors trainings uh, going to uh, camps or 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 to to excursions, uh, uh, challenges, physical challenges, and then you come back and realize, okay, what is what was your experience here? How does it relate to work? Bingo! You get people uh, connecting things. That's where I believe training becomes effective. Perfect. Um, thank you. So I, I wanted to, I wanted to ask one last question. I wanted to thank mm -hmm. you for your time as well. Um, but as with your history, with your past as an educator, as a professor, as a person who has helped with people and been ma mainly your job has been people, right? Your job has mm -hmm. been uh, specifically helping them, helping them grow, helping them get it uh, acclimated, uh, making sure that the best professionals they could possibly be. Um, what would be your argument for the importance of human resources training and the importance of this aspect in any organization, what would be your main argument that says this is this is um, this is very important for our organization for the rest of, of the company culture, as you mentioned before? Um, but what would be your main argument for uh, the importance of HR training in any organization? Uh, before I get any job in my career, before I, I, I was offered a job, I had a lot of interviews, but I would never accept it. I never accepted a job that was not reporting to the president of the company. HR cannot be a, a part or a section of, of finance or uh, public relations or, or any, any other department. It has to be the partner, the senior partner of the president of the company. That way, your influence in the whole organization is the, the highest. Why? It's not because of status. It's not because of anything. It's because if the president of the company or the company, but the company executive is the CEO or the president, mm -hmm. if he or she does not believe that people are the most important asset, it's not just a phrase that say, you have in a company financial uh, you have logistics, you have the building, you have the financials, you have the product, you have the, 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 the customers, and you have the people. All of them are key for success. But if these people are not the best people in the market, and that's to me that the, the, you need to have the best people. And, and there are many other conclusions because of that. Uh, why the best? Because you want to succeed. You want to make money. You want to be the best product, the best service, the best. You need to have the best. How to get the best? First thing, good recruitment. How to retain the best? Excellent salaries. Excellent uh, methods of engaging them, keeping them passionate. How to develop the best? Continuous training. And, and, and how to send the best to the market so the market grows. That's what Citibank had that in mind. And all the senior people that I hired as management trainees in Citibank, after six or seven years, they were senior executives in Citibank and in Bradesco, in Banco do Brasil, in, in all the different companies. So the market was full of senior executives uh, educated and trained in Citibank. 
And that's incredible. This is something that most companies don't see. But when they realize that the whole HR and training operation, because it's, you don't hire an employee and, and, and he stays, he or she stays there. No, you hire the employee, you develop the person and the person keeps growing with the company. If the employee doesn't feel that he or she is growing in the company, he will leave. And that's the reason why many people in your age, people in your, your generation, they say, ah, you know what? Why to stay here? I'm not growing at the pace I would like to know. If the company keeps you growing personally and professionally, why leaving? And, and good money and good, uh, I'm not leaving. Why people are leaving after two, three, four years? Because companies are very slow in adjusting to the new requirements of, of your new generation. Your generation is a generation that needs challenges fast. The company doesn't give me the challenges, I'm leaving. That's why I mean, the average uh, tenure in any company today is three, four years maximum. In my, in my age, they were 15 years, 10. In my father's day, he spent 40 years in the bank. So yeah, that's the answer. No, that does make sense. Um, I want to thank you for your time. I really appreciate all, all the answers and everything. I have no more questions. Um, I, I do think this is a, a very good conversation and uh, I do have a lot of content that I can use for my, my presentation. So anytime, I really appreciate it. Anytime, really appreciate it. anytime you need, anytime you need, anytime you need for a live thing with a group of people, you know, I'm, I'm you ready. Wanna, okay. 